Hello and welcome to another episode of the Manufacturing Leaders Podcast with me, Mark Bracknell, Managing Director of Theo James Recruitment. Today, we welcomed on Vicky Broccoli onto the podcast and what an episode that was. One of the reasons why I now record this intro straight after I've done the episode is mainly because I'm still sort of feeling the after effects and the emotions of the episode. And um, this one, I just feel energetic um, and I think that's very much the case when you speak to Vicky, what you feel after it. Vicky is a senior leadership coach. She has a amazing CV and background within leadership, within manufacturing and engineering roles. Worked for a variety of companies um, like West West Rock, starting a career at Black & Decker and others as well, holding some key senior level positions like managing director, office director and vice president. So. A wonderful career is now applying a trade by helping others in that field as well, which I just know she's absolutely wonderful at. We talk a lot about this podcast about management. This is a fantastic episode for anyone who is a manager or wants to be a manager because you will learn an awful lot from her. We talk about her career. We talk about the importance of being a leader, what a leader is, the importance of um, knowing, understanding the responsibility of being a leader. Um, we talk through what to do if a company or a manager is in trouble or needs help, you know, what the, the first steps you do to do so. We talked about her career breaks and the importance of, of the reset there and what she did in those career breaks, which ultimately helped her positions and, and positions she held after that. Um, and so much more. And one of, the, one of the things I took from this was the, the values that you need as a leader and need to feel as a leader. Vicky talks a lot about the importance of feeling safe as a manager, which is something I'd never thought about, but actually hit home so much. And we talk in detail about that and how leaders need to try and feel safe. And has, as owners of businesses or leaders of people, you should look for the signs where people potentially aren't feeling that. So this was a tremendous episode. I really, really enjoyed it. And I know you are too. You will definitely earn, learn a lot from this episode. So I hope you enjoy. Please subscribe to the channel, whether that be Spotify, YouTube, or whatever you're listening or watching on. I really appreciate that. It means a lot. So uh, if you don't mind just clicking that subscribe um, or review button, that would be most appreciated. But yeah, hope you enjoy the episode. Take care. So a massive warm welcome today uh, with uh, Vicky Broccoli on the Manufacturing Leaders Podcast. I'm, I'm so excited to get on. An absolute uh, powerhouse in the industry. You really will struggle to find a better leadership CV. So um yeah, massive old welcome. We'll go into obviously what Vicky's done her career, but after a, a short career break, um, which for the last year and a bit, she's now been consulting as a, a senior leadership coach. And in your words, um, you have a mission to unlock untapped potential with individuals and companies, which I can't wait to get into. So, Vicky, a massive warm welcome. How are you? Thank you. I'm good, thank you. Excited to be talking to you. Yes, appreciate it. So let's kick things off then. So the usual question, what does it mean to you to be a leader? Um, knowing that you were going to ask this, I kind of gave it some thought. And I think the simplest answer would be to be a leader, you have to have people who are going to follow you. That's the simplest thing. I think the reality is it is so much more complex. It, it's the job that has the utmost responsibility in my mind. And the reason that I say that is I think – I mean, it depends on what level you're at, but certainly some of the levels of the organizations I've been at, you have the responsibility for ensuring the health, safety, and well being, first and foremost. I think after that, it is about the creation and framework of a culture and values and behaviors within that culture. And when I say the framework, I think I'm deliberately picking that because there's only a certain amount that you can do. Um, after that, it is about being a very clear communicator at all levels, up and down, because I think one of the skills genuinely is managing up as well as managing down. Um, I think then you have to be a strategist. You know, we're not all there just to engage and be nice and work together. You have to be aiming for somewhere. So you have to often define the strategy if it doesn't exist. You have to clearly communicate and get alignment to that strategy throughout the organization. 
assessing what the gaps are in skill sets and training needs and so on and so forth. But ultimately, then I think it's about getting that all working together to actually drive forward and deliver that strategy. And not only once, but time and time again, whilst also making sure that you keep an eye on the people, the culture, and whether they are capable of going at the pace maybe you want to go at. Sometimes you have to push forward, sometimes you have to pull back. And that's a really intuitive thing within an organization. So I think ultimately a leader's role is the most responsible thing, you know, ever. But equally, it's the best job in the world. It's like the best job in the world. Um, and the other thing is, I think I just wanted to say that you aren't a leader with job title. I think often think people think a leader comes because of the title that you have. A leader is only a leader if actually your team say that you're a leader. And I think that's by everything that you do and everything that you say. So, yeah, yeah. that's what I think a leader is. And, a company, and that, that's almost like the difference between a manager and leader, isn't it? The two very different things, a job title. And, and then it's the, yeah. like you mentioned, all the values you hold and, and everything that you do on day to day. Yeah, it completely is. And it's something you genuinely, firstly, have to recognize that it's needed because I think there's so many managers who manage the task, they get through the day and they'll be effective to a point. But I think in terms of that that leadership, it really is about that coaching and development. So the management actually becomes less of your day job. It's more about that nurturing of the teams, of the workforce, of the culture. Um, and it is, it's a it's a massive difference. Yeah. Out of an absolute textbook answer. And I guess if you take that as a as a textbook, textbook leader in terms of if they had all those things. From your experience, and particularly your experience over the last year, which I'll, I'll lean on quite a lot in this episode, which would you say is the main thing that you've seen that leaders have had to work on to improve, would you say? Um, I think it differs from organisation to organisation. And I think there's a general piece, which I think is about post-COVID, Obviously, it's about, you know, kind of the mass reg uh, resignation. It's about there being a shortage of talent. The talent that's out there can actually demand maybe what they want. You know, I only want to work two or three days a week in the office. Actually, I want this salary if you want me. Um, and also, I think the recognition that the world became so much smaller as we were locked down and we all had these, you know, kind of Zoom meetings so i think there's a massive thing of talent retention of talent absolutely um and i think the only thing that really i think there's a big gap in is people taking the opportunity to reset their culture in a new world and I guess what I mean by that is, you know, the, you've had many people on your podcasts who talk about cultures and values and behaviours. None of that, none of that's new. And, you know, I'm sure we drive that to varying degrees. But I think that certainly post-COVID, it is about saying actually that culture and how it worked before in terms of those dynamics, it doesn't work like that anymore. And what we need to do is genuinely think about putting that back on the agenda to say, how do we get it to work in a way in which it doesn't stifle the innovation, the teamwork, that discretionary effort that people have? Um, but also, I think one of the things is that talented individuals within organisations or even um, individuals who might be struggling have become less visible. So once over, you know, you'd walk through the office, you could see, bloody hell, they're on the top of the game. You could see so-and-so is having a bad day today. Now that is so much less visible. You need to have other mechanisms in place to do that. So I think that's one of the things that I see people struggle with. 
The other things that I see people struggle with, particularly because I guess I go into a lot of either businesses that are underperforming, so they need to turn around often financially. Um, when I go into those businesses, I tend to find leaders or managers, both of, who are struggling for what to do, what to do next, and don't really know who to talk to or who to turn to. Because I think often when organisations are struggling, they look to the leader. Right, OK, we're not doing well. What, what are we going to do now? And sometimes the leader may have got that organisation to that place where they're struggling through some of their own actions, behaviours, strategy, whatever. Um, sometimes the marketplace has changed. We haven't reacted quickly enough. Um, so I think there's a number of factors, but I think... Often people feel this huge responsibility as the leader to have all of the answers. Um, and I found that quite common. And then the other common thing that I find is when people know what's wrong and they start about trying to fix things, they try and fix too many things at once. And what happens as a result of that is you never do anything effectively, but also you lose people off because they cannot take that level of change and push forward on all fronts. So I think you have to be very, very clear about all of these things are wrong and that's fine, but these are the biggies and this is what we're going to work on now and this is what we're going to get aligned behind. And once we've done that, we'll work on the others. But in the meantime, forget about the others, just forget about them. So, as I said, varies from business to business. Some you see throughout, but those are some of the common factors, I guess I would think. And I love that, and I resonate with all that so much. And I was just when you were talking, there, I was thinking back to you know period of time where we've struggled, and as a leader, how do you react? And I think in hindsight, I think sometimes you try and throw all these new things at people. Let's try this, try that. How about this? How about that? And it almost you're overcomplicating the job. Where sometimes there's there's a power in just simplifying things, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Sometimes it's actually back to basics. Yeah, yeah. Actually, basics probably worked in the first place. Mm -hmm. And sometimes organisations can become so evolved in some ways, they forget the foundations that were there in the first place. Yeah. And you go back and you look. I mean, one of the things that I typically find is that if I go into a business, somebody like the CEO or somebody has always told me what's wrong with it. Right. They always know what's wrong with it. Yeah. And that's typically from them sitting in an office looking at the numbers. This yeah. is what's wrong with it. More often than not, I will go into the business. That is definitely not what, what's wrong with it. But again, in terms of some of the basics, it's like quality. So quite often organizations think they have a labor or efficiency problem. It's like I've got too many people, get rid of some people or whatever. The truth of it is you actually haven't got a handle on quality. So you're doing things two and three times, you're putting them in the bin, you scrap, you know, your scraps out of control. Um, so yeah, I think often it's doing the basics well and keep coming back to check in that you're doing the basics well. Yeah, the process of it, Doug. Yeah, 100 percent agree. Um, I wanted I want to dig a little bit. I think I don't want to waste too much uh, waste too much time, but I think you've got so much knowledge that I think I'll try and get as much out of that in the, in the short space we have. But at the same time, I think it would be nice for people to understand a bit about your background and, and why you do what you do, because I alluded to it at the start, but your CV is, I, mean, I was looking at this morning thinking, wow, do you know what I mean? In terms of MD, vice president, you know, all these senior roles with some different types of businesses, you know, all shapes and sizes, yeah. big hitters yeah. and some SMEs. Did you, was it always apparent you wanted that was the career was going to be for you there. Were you always very sort of driven? Or how did that come about? Oh my God, no. <laughs> Absolutely not. So this might um this often surprises people, but I'm actually not an ambitious person. Fair. Like I'm really not, and I never was. Um, and people say, Well, you must be with that. And I'm like, I didn't, I just did a good job at doing what I was doing, and somebody recognized me to go, Can you please go and do this? Yeah. And so I've always been about if I feel I can make a difference and I feel there's a job to do, I'm happy to do that. 
but I've never been a caretaker manager. So I'm not one of these people. Once everything's in place, the team's established, I don't really enjoy just ticking over. So if I'm totally honest, I actually stumbled into a career in manufacturing is okay. the best way I can put it. Yeah. So I was lucky enough um, after I graduated to join Black & Decker, which was a great, great learning ground. Um, so they were very much an organisation that threw you in at the deep end and it was sink or swim. And some people loved that and stayed forever. Some people hated it and left immediately. Um, so I was lucky that for five years within Black & Decker, I did a variety of roles. So I worked in quality. I um, implemented a European warranty system for them. Um, again, I was I was young, but it was like, can you go and do that? Um, yeah, OK. Don't know what to do, but I'll give it a go. Yeah. Um, product development. I did some work in marketing. And after five years, I thought, I'm not really enjoying this. I don't know what I want to do. So I went to HR and I said, I'm going to leave. And they said, why? I said, because I don't know what I want to do. And they were like, right, leave it with us over the weekend. So on the Monday, they came back and offered me three different roles. And one of them was in manufacturing. So from a selfish point of view, I'd never had any supervisory experience. Um, also, um, I thought, well, if I don't like it, I'm leaving anyway. So there's no downside to it. So I said, right, I'll take the job in manufacturing. And they were like, OK. So I went from the Friday of having no supervisory experience to the Monday, having 150 people on three shifts wow. on a brand new product that had launched on a brand new assembly line that the shelves in Argos and B&Q were empty of this jigsaw that had just launched. And that's what they put me in charge of. And I was like, oh, my God, so. like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? So for three to four months, I can genuinely say I was like, what have I done? Just what have I done? Um, I had sleepless nights. I was there like 18 hours a day. I just was completely out of my depth. Um, I had some good people around me to coach me. Um, I had a lot of faith in me because I'm aware that people at the time were saying, you need to take her out of this. You need to put somebody else in. You need to take her out of it. And thankfully, my boss at the time was like, no, because if we do that, we've lost her. Just give her a bit more time. Anyway, I'm going to say after three to four months, it just clicked. Something just clicked and I got it. And I thought, oh, my God, this is what I was always intended to do. I was always intended to be in manufacturing. And as I say, I genuinely stumbled across it, not out of ambition, but just out of boredom in the roles that I was doing and thinking, I don't really fit. It's not really satisfying me. Um, so, yeah, so I went from that to I was then asked to head up the Kaizen Initiative, which was about 18 months later. And I had only had half a day's training in Kaizen, as it was then. And this global VP came over for a presentation and then called me into the office and said, we'd like to, you to head up the initiative for a site with 3,000 people. And I was like, but I've had half a day's training. And he was like, you just get it. You'll work the rest out. Mm. So I said, OK, I'll give it a go. Yeah. So I gave it a go. Then I became the manufacturing manager, which at that time we had like 900 temps on site. So it was a massive role. Um, and then I probably was getting approached to say, can you go and run this factory in China? Can you go and run this factory in the US? Can you go and do this? And genuinely, I'm a home bird. I actually like being at home. I like being in the Northeast. I like being around friends and family. So I kept saying, no, no, no. And then I was approached for an ops director's role at a, a local business. They wanted the business transforming. So I did that. Then they asked me to become MD, which at that point I had no experience of sales and marketing. And I was like, are you sure? And they said, yeah. And we went, 
okay, then I'll give it a go. Um, so as I say, that developed into me selling the business, which I'd never done. I then took a career break. Then after that, I thought, what do I want to do? And genuinely, I've always been drawn to things that are broken, whether that's culturally or financially. <clears throat> so if somebody rings me and goes, Vicky, we've got this job, everything's broken. You know, there's union issues. There's, <laughs> you know, there's <laughs> lose a couple of million. And I'm like, oh, where do I sign? <laughs> so, so, yeah, without going through the rest of my career, I've then just been interestingly approached to do jobs. As I say, I have never set out. When people say, what do you want to do in five years? I was never, oh, I want this job title or I want this salary. I'm actually just happy knowing that in the roles that I do, I make a difference. And I go home and I think that was a great day or, you know, somebody's cracked that or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's the potted history of it. Love that, and it looks so much, so much stuff to pick out there, and it's an exciting career as well. Do you? Th you mentioned there that you had faith in yourself in situations where probably everything around you was was crumbling, and a lot of people, you know, wouldn't have felt like that in that way. How did you get to that? Because I imagine a lot of leaders struggle sometimes with their own confidence, but yet they're, they're trying to portray this calm presence of control when inside they're thinking, "I can't do it." How, how did you get to that? Do you think? Yeah, in those early days, I don't think I don't think I was looking calm. <laughs> yeah. It was like, oh my god, what am I doing? Um, so I think, do you know what? I think I'm very different in those early days when I first was. I was a manager. I wasn't a leader then. Um, I. I did become a leader very quickly um, because to be given the roles that, that I had, but I certainly wasn't a leader then. And do you know what? I think firstly, you need to seek out help. You need to seek out coaches. And again, I was very lucky. So um, interestingly, my husband worked, he wasn't my husband then, but he worked on the area that I managed. Um, he was a great coach for me in those days. He would spot things and say, have you seen that's happening over there? You need to do this, that and the other. Um, I had other leaders in the business who weren't in the manufacturing area, but had obviously spotted something in me and was had, had said, look, I'd like to be your coach. And I'm like, yes, please. Like, what do I need to learn? Um, so I think it's, finding coaches around you, even if it's people who don't have an insight at that point, but you know you are safe to go and close the door and go, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where to go next. Um, who can calm you down and build you back up and send you back out there. And some of it for me is about humility. So genuinely, I think as you become a manager, people test you. So as I say, I've gone to having nothing to 150 people. I don't know what to do. And I was young, you know, I was only in my um, like early mid twenties at that point. And I think some of it is about humility and recognizing that actually people around you know exactly what needs to happen. And if you can take your ego out of the way, which I've never really had a big ego, but if you take that out of the way and you ask everybody around you, like, this isn't going well and I don't really know what to do. What do you think? So um, what I find is that with that humility, people actually want to help, particularly in the Northeast. I think, you know, people want to help and don't really want to see you fail, providing you're good with them providing you're nice with them, you treat them in the right way. So what I felt was that in those times, I was very honest about my shortfalls, my vulnerabilities. But what I've found that is actually the nub of how I operate. So 
I did a business degree, so I'm not an engineer. I don't understand those things. There's always smarter people than me in the room. But what I'm very, very good at doing is asking people's opinions. I'm a good listener, and I'm really good at joining the dots to find what the solution is, and then clearly communicating what we need to do. So I think that's what I did at that time unknowingly. That's what I do now more consciously. But the other thing for me is to always look for the teachers around you because they don't always come from the most natural places. It's not always your boss. In many, in many cases for me, it hasn't been my boss, but be there all around if you just open your eyes to find them. Yeah, love that. And you strike me as someone who doesn't live a life of regrets when you're talking about your career there you just did it yeah. and then you imagine your mentality was what's the worst that can happen I'll, I'll, I'll learn on the job was that have I got that right yeah 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 absolutely well as I said I was going to leave anyway so yeah. from a really selfish point of view I thought well on my CV I can say I had some supervisory experience and then I'll leave yeah. but again that's a great thing because Often, you know, I'll talk to younger people about, oh, God, manufacturing. And I'm like, oh, God, it's the best place ever. You know, just the noise and sometimes the dirt and the chaos and everything about it. And, um, yeah, I think I genuinely did not see myself fitting there. That was never something, if I'd sat with a careers advisor, where I would have ended up. So again, I think you have to try things. And going back to that regret, I'm always somebody that I think, as soon as I'm not enjoying something, I think, right, I need to leave. So during my career, I gave distribution a try. So I ran a big distribution center for ASDA. If I'm honest, no, disre no disrespect to distribution people, it was boring. It was boring compared to manufacturing. Um, but there was a job to be done. I made a difference at the site. Then I took on a national role. I made a difference there. But then I thought, this isn't for me. I need to get back. So I think sometimes, yes, you have to try things, knowing what's the worst that's going to happen. I can then course correct and go somewhere else if it's not for me. What, what I'm also interested as well is, and you don't see this often in CVs, probably because people, I think people hide it and they'll, they'll, they'll sort of embellish the CV a little bit. You've got quite clear and almost looks like it might not be, but it looks like planned career breaks. And and that struck me straight away, actually, because I still think, and I think people hide it because I know for a fact, because we have feedback from clients sometimes, they don't like it when people have had a career break and they've almost got some hesitation, which which I don't agree with. But you're, you're, you're someone who has had advantages from doing that, would you say? Absolutely. So going back to where you started and what kind of motivates me and I said that I'm not somebody who has been particularly ambitious so I know even though I've achieved a lot I could have done far more but I'm not somebody who's motivated by money title latest car um so so long as I've got enough and I've always known that when I've had enough I don't need more so my first career break was when I sold the business at Henderson. And that was a particularly emotional time because I genuinely cared about that workforce and the market had changed significantly. And I remembered saying to, to my boss who was in Sweden, the market's changed and there's too much capacity and we either need to buy somebody or they need to buy us. It was as simple as that. Anyway, he said, go and find a buyer. And I was like, oh, my God. Anyway, without going into that story, I found that emotionally draining when you care about people and care about teams and so on. So I found the buyer and I wrote into the sale agreement that I would stay for six months, but then I was out. I, I just couldn't work for the new buyer, the new owner, sorry. So um, after that, I got some money to leave. And I thought okay, that would be nice. I could put that in the bank and go and get the next job. But I just thought emotionally, I need a break. I just need a break. And I ended up going to volunteer for um, for DePaul, which is 16 to 25 year olds. Um, so young, homeless, whatever. 
um, I ended up working in a young offenders institute and I ended up writing a resettlement program for them so that they could get funding and then delivering this resettlement program. Oh. So at some point, my husband said, Vicky, you do realize you're working like three or four days voluntary. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, but I love it. So I probably did that, I'm going to say, for like six or eight months. And then I thought, right, I need to go and get a job. And I think sometimes is, despite the fact I don't really have an ego, I know that I'm good at what I do. So I, wa I was never thinking, oh, my God, what if I don't get another job? So I did that, which was great. And then the second career break I took um, was after my mum and dad died. So I lost my parents within eight weeks of each other. And again, that was like a, a tough time. I think whoever, you know, doesn't matter what age you are when you lose your parents, like it's a tough time. So I'd said to my husband, I just feel like I need a reset. Shall we take a career break? Do you fancy packing your job in? And I know that sounds a bit bizarre, but because he knows me now, he went to work and said, can I have a career break for a couple of months? And they'd said, no. And he said, okay, I'm resigning. Right. And they were like, huh? And he said, yeah, I'm resigning. So um, we took a career break. We went traveling around the US, but then... We actually went to Sri Lanka because I felt like I'm so grateful for everything that I have. I, I feel like I want to give back. So I thought I'm grateful for all of these travel experiences, but I want to go and do something that like feeds my soul. Yeah. So we ended up going to Sri Lanka and working in a Buddhist temple school. Oh, yeah. So Jared was in the temple and I was teaching English to the to the monks or to the young monks, and then the elder monks asked me, would I teach them English? Which was extremely intimidating, given the fact that these elders had like four and five degrees. Yeah. And I'm like, not even an English teacher, I just know how to speak it. <laughs> and it was just, oh, just such a wonderful experience for just resetting, taking stock of everything and then kind of coming back and going again. Apologies for interrupting this podcast for a very quick 30 second pitch of my business. Theo James are a specialist manufacturing and engineering recruitment search firm based in Seaham in the Northeast. If you're looking for any staff or a new opportunity yourself from a semi-skilled level, right the way up to C-suite executive, then please get in touch. We have a specialist consultant in each discipline ready to help. I'm extremely proud of what we've built over the years. And I'd love to extend that service out to you. Thank you. Enjoy the podcast. So we were kind of, so I was in my 40s, Jared was in his 50s. We decided to do the proper plan my gap year. Yeah. So it only was like, it was disgusting. It was disgusting, the living arrangements. And we were joking after like a couple of days. Should we just go on holiday for a few weeks and tell our friends that we did it, but we didn't really? Let's just go home. <laughs> so I think it taught us something about resilience. Absolutely. It taught us something about relying on those around around you. You know, we only had each other. Um, but it also was a big eye opener. And I think this comes back to having enough of Sometimes we get so focused on stuff and things, don't we? You know, like the next big house, the next big car, whatever it may be. And to see a culture where people had nothing, but actually they had everything. They had everything in terms of warmth, kindness, fun, connection. You know, they would have so much fun playing with a stick and a stone. And to see that and to live with it up close was just a real thing about, do you know what? There's so much more to life than sometimes we recognize. Yeah, love that. And I imagine when you came back and look, I, I appreciate it isn't, it isn't possible for everyone to take a real break financially. I, I appreciate that. The fair, but then, oh. that being said, there's a lot of people unfortunately go through redundancies and have a, a, a sort of sum at the end of it. And you're right. A lot of people then it's panic stations to try and get another job, which I completely get, but there will be people who 
probably are fearful of taking a career break because they think it will hinder their chances of getting opportunity. But imagine when you came back, you know, if if, you, if I was sat down with you now, interviewing you, you tell me about that, I would, you know, that uh, th- you can tell you've been a better place than you were however long we started to go because of the skills you learned. And, and like you say, that reset, so important because manufacturing, leadership, stressful positions, really stressful. Yeah. It, abso- it absolutely is. And it's funny you say that. Actually, it, it's never it's never held me back, um, except after I came back from the Sri Lanka career break and I was um, interviewing for, for a job, the, one of the people who were interviewing me, when I went back to the recruitment agency, they said they've just got one reservation. And uh, I was like, oh, what's that? And they said, oh, it's just with you needing to take a break after your mum and dad died, whether you are emotionally resilient enough. And I was like, really um so I said well look back at my CV to see that reach out to a number of these people sometimes there's things that are important in life and sometimes the the job we do and the money that we get so they need to think about that and if the answer is no great it wasn't the organization for me and anyway they reached out to a couple of people and they were like resilient my god (laughs) you know you've obviously never met Vicky so I think I've had that but other than that I think people are interested to talk about it and you're right everybody's fortunate enough to be able to do it but again sometimes there's cheaper ways of doing it so I said we did it in the proper way with on my gap year so your accommodation if you could call it that was paid for um you know, your living costs were next to nothing. So in actual fact, it didn't cost us an awful lot to get an experience of a lifetime. Yeah, and I bet, I bet that grounded you so much when you came yeah. back. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. That's, it's, it a nice, it's a nice segue, Vicky, on to, you know, to values. And I know when we when we spoke, you know, before this podcast, you know, you were, you were talking about, you know, values and leadership, how important it is. And, and you mentioned something which, which I, I've never heard before, which I really like, was that, the importance of feeling safe and and any training I've had, anything, I've never had that as a as something. It really resonated with me in terms of that side to it. Yeah. Um, just, yeah. what, what do you mean by that when you talk about that, just so people understand? Yeah. So I think when I thought about my values, a word kept coming back, which was safe. I know when I turn up to do work, I want to make people feel safe. And I know from their reaction, they feel safe. And I don't mean safety, which I think is something equally as important. So what I think it is when leaders are in positions, as I said before, people have all eyes on them. It's like, what are you going to do? And often, if people aren't skilled enough in finding, as I said earlier, the teachers and the coaches around them, they carry with them a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of I don't know what to do, a lot of sleepless nights and so on. And I've turned up at so many places where I'm like, just talk to me, just talk to me. I'm I'm not going to go back to your boss. I'm not going to go, just talk to me. And it's amazing, firstly, how many people, the reaction that I thought I was going to get isn't the reaction. I've had so many people break down, so many people break down in tears, which are like, I just don't know what to do. I, I genuinely don't know what to do. And I feel I'm part of the problem. I've got us to this point and I don't know how to get us out of it. Um, so I'm like, that's fine. That's fine. That's why I'm here. I can help. It's OK. I've been there before. I know where you're at. I know how to get us through it. Do you trust me? So I think there's something about making people feel safe so that they can think and communicate clearly. Sometimes that thinking is actually, do you know what? I've been promoted beyond my capability or I'm in the wrong organisation or this isn't for me or whatever. We can talk through that. Sometimes it's just how do I communicate with my team through this chaos and show some of that vulnerability, but not look as if I'm crumbling. Because again, if the leader's crumbling, then actually we all might as well go home. So I think there's something about just genuinely creating that safe space. 
and again I was I was coaching somebody the other day and they have an, a difficulty with their team and with expectations and and delivery and communication and um we were talking about facilitating a, a session and they were like yeah yeah that's great I said how do you feel no that's great I said how do you really feel like talk to me how do you really feel I'm a bit scared. And I said, why? And they said, because sometimes, because I know what the team think of me, I'm not good at responding on the spot. And I said, okay, do you trust me? And they said, yeah. And I said, right, if you trust me, trust that I know you well enough that if I read that in your face, I'll say, actually, I don't want you to respond to that now. I just want you to think about it. So I can make you feel safe and protect you. And they were like, okay, that's good. So I think being safe is one of my core values. It's making people feel safe so that we can start working on what the real issues are. Yeah, uh, yeah, that, yeah. I think that, that's, that's brilliant. Um, I really like that. Do you think in terms of when you're coaching people, is it more, would you say the biggest impact is, is also the communication in terms of improving someone's communication? Is it improving someone's, sort of day-to-day -day, so they have the time to think and to plan or what do you think makes the biggest impact with people who are going through issues like that? Um, again, it differs. So some is people just don't get engagement. <laughs> they just don't get it. Um, and they don't get how, oh, I've got all of this to do. Well, actually, let's break this down because is all of that yours to do or is it other people's? Some of it's that. Some of it is driven from the, we often get promoted, as everybody says, because you're the best at something. Yep. Do you know what I mean? You, as an engineer, you're the best person at fixing machines. Oh, you need to be the engineer and manager. And often what you find is you get to that level and really you want to be fixing machines. So instead of you spending your time managing budgets, looking at team development and so on. You're on the shop floor fixing machines because that's what you always wanted to do. Um, so I think there's there's a mixture of things. Um, I think sometimes there's genuinely the, that delegation and understanding what is really critical on the to-do list and if I was to delegate, how do I delegate it? And being totally honest about, actually, I just want to do that because I love doing that. So I think there's a bit about unpicking somebody's way of working that sees, that gets to the core of what the problem is and why they are not being as successful as they could be. And I know that doesn't really answer the question because Everybody is an individual and everybody will have a different issue. But I think fundamentally, it doesn't come down to, it very, very rarely comes down to strategy. Yeah. Like it doesn't come, I don't know what we need to do or, oh, how can I get those machine speeds up or how can I improve the quality or whatever? It's not that. It's about the way in which we are working as individuals and we are, inspiring engaging aligning our teams to deliver whatever it is needs to be delivered but you really have to pick that apart to know which bit you're trying to coach on yeah like that would you have any advice for perhaps owners of businesses or, or you know very senior people businesses who, who are managing senior people to what to look out for so their staff aren't their leaders aren't stressed because i think a lot of the time you know particularly let's say you know, scene level might be ops director getting pressure from them. D they put pressure on the ops and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you see quite a lot of that? Yeah, yeah. Um, what to look out for? I mean, do you know, sometimes, sometimes I think as a leader, things are so instinctive that you just see them. Yeah. It's actually quite difficult to articulate what to look out for because for me it's so deep rooted it's like a change in somebody's behavior you think they aren't usually like that or you know it's 
they didn't spend as long chatting about the football at the weekend. Or it's that they're a bit short with the team in meetings. Or it could be that um, the performance has dropped off. Um, and I think sometimes when an organisation's having a hard time, I think we all do that bit. Well, we're leaders. That's what we get paid for, isn't it? You know, yeah. just get on with leading. And, you know, we'll go for a beer and a night out like once we threw the worst of it or once we see month end results or whatever. And it's not about that. It's getting people through that daily thing and having that constant eye on all of that, which is why I said that actually when you are a fully evolved leader, that's what you spend your time doing. Yeah. That's what I found that I spent my time doing is checking in on everybody else. So yes, there's an element of strategy, alignment to strategy and everything, but I'm not really delivering the strategy. All my teams and all my leaders are delivering the strategy. You just need to make sure that they are okay. They are okay in themselves, their teams are okay, and that you can support and coach wherever that needs to be. Um, and I think if it's something, one of the things that I would say, if it's something that doesn't come instinctively, then I think reach out for somebody else to do a check on that for you. Because, you know, we talked um, about some of the challenges now post-COVID, particularly around retention and, you know, people can move more than they ever did. And what you don't want to do is miss something like that, miss the opportunity to have a conversation, to get some coaching or whatever, to keep a good person, just for the fact that you actually didn't see it happening. Yeah, yeah I get that completely. And, and what I'm getting from that as well, which is, and I've learned so much today as well, so thank you very much. What I'm getting from it is is the importance of presence as well. And I think, you know, I'm, when you're talking, I'm reflecting as well, thinking, what do I look for? And actually... When leaders are so busy and so engrossed in your own in your own shit, basically, how present are you? That actually yeah. checking in because there's a difference, isn't it, between asking if someone's okay and watching to see if there's any difference in how they were, how they typically are. Yeah. And particularly, as I said, when you're on a screen. Yeah. Yeah. It's different um when everybody is in the same environment. It's much, much easier to pick up those nuances about they're not in a good place today. What What's happened? Um, it's so much easier to put on a front behind a screen because it it's like, I've got Mark for an hour. Right, okay, I need to be on my game and I need to be this. You know, literally they could press leave the meeting and be sitting crying their eyes out because something's happening or they're struggling at home or they're struggling in work or whatever it may be. So I genuinely think as I think I started with, there's this time to reset cultures in a way where hybrid working is a norm. Yeah. And some of that resetting cultures is the mechanisms that we were in place before to check out for people, whether that's, oh, when we meet in the coffee room or, you know, when we chat about football or whatever it is that we do. And um, some of those mechanisms aren't there anymore. And you need to deliberately create new mechanisms. Otherwise, people will be struggling in silence. People will be struggling behind a screen. They won't have put the camera on or whatever it may be. And you don't see that because they're not face to face with you. And again, if you don't deliberately look to create something different out of that, then you will lose talent. You will, because there'll be somebody else who is creating that space that makes people feel safe. And, you know, somebody comes along with an extra five grand and they go, no, because I like being here. I like being part of this team. I like being looked after. You know, I feel like Mark really cares about me. Um, so I think it really is a time that we need to think about how are we doing those things in a different way? way of working in a different environment i love that it's such good advice and and you're so right because i think i so i always know how people are when they walk for the door in the morning I, I, that's the first thing i always look for they walk in are they, are they coming in 
Are they saying low straight away? Are they, are they head down? I can tell, particularly in a you know in a sales environment where you, you're almost you don't like that saying really as good as your last month. You know, people still feel that in them. I can always tell straight away, and you, and you just can't get that from from a Zoom call where someone's probably gone and then click the camera on, and then then had an hour and jumped off again, and it's just you can't see when they're behind. I mean, we're you know I think people are fearful with this work from home stuff of trying now and i get it completely to it's the war on talent to try and compete with benefits okay we'll have hybrid working we'll have we'll have four days five days working because that will attract people to the business but is that actually what right for a for your business and b yeah. for actually for individuals i mean we're off the feedback we've taken internally we're now we're not having not giving as much flexibility we're going to move to one day where we perhaps all work from home and, and the rest of it when we're all there together because people miss that interaction and and the buzz that, that it provides, it's changed, isn't it? it? You know, I mean, a lot of my close friends now are people I've met at work. Yeah. That's where you connect. And, you know, I know I have friends whose children have started their first career and they are working one day a week from home, from the office, the rest four days a week at home. How do you learn? How do you form connections? How do you actually understand dynamics and coach? Like, how does that even work? All that we're going to do is people are going to be trained in a task. Yeah. That's it. They can do task completion because the rest of it, that development, that discretionary effort, all comes from communities of people being together, yeah. sharing, learning of each other, having a laugh, you know, having the hard times, you know, somebody's having a cry or I've got the toilet with them. All of those things come from being together, not being behind the screen. But you're absolutely right. It has to work for everybody because I know, you know, I'm a different generation to people in the 20s. What works for them wouldn't work for me. But again, if that is an open dialogue that says somewhere we have to meet in the middle and what does in the middle look like and let's all sign up to being in the middle and then let's if in the middle isn't quite working we can course correct later but you have to have that conversation it's not going to just evolve yeah, completely agree i think it's apple now someone told me you bring out a headset of like a, a virtual reality headset where you put it on and then literally you're with your team you can see each other and and I know it scares the life out of me, but that's probably how, how the new generation of kids are just, that's all we'll know and we'll be trying to take yeah. them out of this augmented reality. But it's it's scary stuff. It really is because I, I agree. I'm, uh, you know, I, I just think people need that connection. And I think it's only now we're starting to see the effects of people being year or two in just behind the screen yeah. from home. I think it's, yeah. And I am now starting to see people, more people wanting to, I've seen that change now, I've seen that change yeah. quite a bit, which I think. Yeah. I might not be back to normal, but I think it's definitely getting getting there again, which is which is good. Um, I've got some quick fire questions. Should have that okay. quick fire. Let's have a go. Who's the best manager you've ever had, or why? <laughs> You're going to say husband, aren't you? <laughs> you've got to say husband. <laughs> no, he wasn't my manager. Oh, I was not? his. Oh, no, there you we go. Had to marry me. <laughs> <laughs> um. Do you know, this is a really sad indictment mm -hmm. that I cannot name one name. And that isn't because I haven't had good managers, but I don't think that I've ever had one manager that's embodied everything that I think about being a good leader. And it's a bit like, as I said to you, there's bits I can pick out of each one. And I'm always looking for... Who can I learn from and what can I take from that? But I'm actually struggling to say one person. You know, I'm grateful that I've had many, many people who have given me massive opportunities and given me jobs that I didn't even think I was ready for. Um, but I've never had somebody who really embodied everything that I would want. Do you think that's driven driven you on to because it's almost like you've learned from your failures, don't you? So you probably you pick up on the things poor you not saying poor managers, but the ways in which yeah. you improve. Do you think that that's driven you on to be a good leader? I do. I do. Um, 
because I've always thought, what do I want from this person? And I've never got everything that I've wanted. Yeah. So I'm thinking, right, okay, if I didn't get that and that, that's what I want to give to my teams. Yeah, yeah I like that. Um, biggest influence from business, entertainment, sport world, anything? What do you say? Famous person, if you like. Right. Have you seen Ted Lasso? I have, very recently. Big fan. Yeah? You know what? No, it, it, some management tips in there, isn't there? Do you know what? I think there is so much out of that. So, so you know, you you can say, there's so many people, because I'm always listening to um, podcasts. I quite like inspirational things. If I'm at the gym, you know, I'll I'll have inspirational, like, words on and stuff like that. Um, and so I think there's always something you can learn from somebody, you know, um, not from a political point of view, because I couldn't comment, but somebody like Barack Obama, I could always listen to him. He was a great orator and you genuinely felt his empathy for situations and stuff. So I think you take little bits from different people, but do you know what? I genuinely think Ted Lasso is genius from the point of view of, when you look at leadership, so he didn't know the strategy. So he doesn't know the strategy, he has to rely on the people around him and gives them the freedom to then go, okay, let's do that. He included everyone. So there wasn't a level where somebody would go, you're the boot man, Nate, so you can't be coaching on the team. Nate, you've got a good idea. Okay, let's go with what Nate thinks. He created an environment where people felt, felt safe. He recognised individuals and diversity and supported appropriately. Um, he was great at telling anecdotes that got the message across in a more emotional level. Um, he never, ever let ego get in his way. Um, he created that space where men talked with the diamond dogs. So they'd all turn, they'd talk, didn't have to have a solution, but they talked and they were open. He didn't change tactics when they weren't winning. He had belief in the process. And if we keep going, he didn't blame anyone when they weren't winning. And that led to success and, and so on. And then I think he created that culture that we were talking about, whereby Jamie goes to Man City, but he wants to be back with Richmond because he wants to feel part of that. He wants to be part of that team and that nurturing and, and everything else. And just genuinely, he was kind. And if there was just more Ted Lasso's in the world, it would be a better place. So yeah. do you know what? Every Amazing. week, I'm going to be Ted Lasso. In fact, that's the best description of it. You know what it is? It's the best description of, of why. I've said before to some people, it's a great mate, and they've gone, why? Now, I've, I've found it hard to communicate, but that, you're absolutely right, everything there. The only thing I will say is... Um, don't use his sayings. I think um, one of the girls she had a bad day and I went, be a goldfish. And she just looked at me like, what are you talking about? So don't don't <laughs> use his sayings unless you can back it up. But no, I completely agree. It's uh, I loved it. It's uh, excellent. Yeah. What three things or words make up a good leader? First things that come to your mind. Confidence, empathy, communication. Love that. Excellent. Um, Apart from this podcast, obviously, which any uh, any books or podcasts you recommend that have been an inspiration for you? Would you say? Um, I love listening to anything with Simon Sinek. I I really like the guy. I love his delivery. I love just his messaging. Um, I, li I, I guess a lot of people now listen to um, Stephen Bartlett. So I don't listen to all of them, but if he's got somebody on that, I think. Um, I'd, I'd quite like to listen to that. Um, in terms of one of one of the books that's always stood out to me, and it's it's a small section within the book, but it's always something that I've really honed on to, is, um, I don't know if you've read it, it's Jim Collins and Good to Great. Great book. And the message to me is, when he talks about strategy, he, he um, relates it to 
a bus trip. And he's saying, get the right people on the bus and the wrong people off the bus. When you've got the right people on the bus, put them in the right seats and then decide where you're going. And I just love that. I, I just really love that, that there are some people in organisations shouldn't be there. You need to get them off the bus. And some people in organisations are good people, but they could be great people if they were sitting in a different seat. Yeah. So, yeah, so that's one that springs to mind. Love that. And just finally, if you could give yourself, you've had a tremendous career, and I'm sure one, you know, it's been, it's been great to reflect on it. If you could give yourself one piece of advice when you were first starting out, particularly in those pressurized situations, and there might be someone listening right now in those, what would you what would you give? It would be, do not be afraid to say, I don't know. I don't know what to do. What do you think? Because every single time I have done that, I've never been let down. I have never, ever been let down. And I think you just need to put your ego to one side. You just need to accept that you've been given whichever job you've been given or whatever title you've been given or whatever. Um, but you won't know all of the answers. But somebody around you probably does or they will know a piece of it and you can piece it together to know what to do next. So never, ever be afraid of saying, I don't know, can you help? Brilliant. And look, that's a, it's a tremendous way to... Uh... So I look, thank you. It's, it's felt like a real privilege. This, you know, most you know, people normally have to pay for this type of advice from you. So I really appreciate you you coming on and like, like I say, you know, if there's, which I'm sure there is, you know, leaders in manufacturing firms listening, then, you know, I'm sure. And what's the best way to contact you? Just on LinkedIn or what? What's the best? Then probably if they could just send me a message on LinkedIn, I can get back to them. Yeah, and and you know what, I I have a management coach, and it helps me so much. Like I didn't realize until I had one. But you, you yeah. mentioned yourself that that safe place to talk where there's no judgment. It's yeah. it's imperative, and I think um, you know for for people listening who perhaps their coaches and leaders or, or they need one themselves. I think it's brilliant, and the, the, you know the journey you've had in manufacturing. You know you can draw on all that. So thank you. Normally there's there's got one or two things that I can draw on. There's so much stuff I've learned from this. You know, and just in terms of being a leader, the importance of it, the the value side to it so many tips so it'd be wrong to name one so thank you very much for it's been there it's been it's been great thanks mark <laughs>